All right, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to continue um, with our last couple micro minerals. So today we're doing selenium and uh, chromium. So just to kind of remind you from your chemistry classes, selenium um, can exist in a whole bunch of different valence states. So in the body, it can exist um, in the minus two state, the four plus state, and then the um, six plus state as well. But in chemistry, you know it um, can exist in all, all those other states as well. Total body stores of selenium are really low. So just like 13 to 30 milligrams, uh, we don't store too much of it. Uh, it really does kind of just one function in the body. So I'll show you what that is in a second. But um, yeah, so we basically just use it in one enzyme and that's probably why it's kind of in low concentrations. Um, interestingly, it does have similar uh, chemistry to sulfur, so it can exist in um, kind of the same valence states as sulfur. So you can actually substitute in selenium for sulfur in um, some amino acids. So good sources, kind of higher food sources of selenium are, well actually the highest is Brazil nuts, so you can get super high amounts in Brazil nuts. And then just to compare, the RDA for selenium is 55 for both, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for both men and women, 55 micrograms per day. So if you look over here, basically Brazil nuts provide about 10 times that amount. And one ounce is about one or two Brazil nuts from what, um, from what I kind of calculated. So yeah, you basically get 10 times the amount that you need um, just with a couple Brazil nuts. And I guess that's just because it's in really high concentrations in the soil where um, Brazil nuts are grown. I guess in Brazil, most likely, <laughs> um, primarily. Um, you can also find it in meats and seafood, and then kind of like moderate intakes in grains and dairy. You kind of find it in um, a lot of different things. So not really found in like fruits and vegetables, but kind of in a whole host of other things. And then, you know, even just one serving of seafood can get you your selenium needs for the day. And then kind of similar to all the other minerals we're talking about, particularly like zinc and copper, selenium content of food really varies widely. So it really depends on how depleted the soil is of the mineral. Obviously, if it's depleted, then you're going to make food that's depleted in um, selenium. But if you have good source, like soil that is uh, kind of plentiful or has a lot of these different minerals, then the, the foods, of course, would have really high levels as well. And then that, what I mean by origin of the food is that obviously varies around the world, kind of just like different types of soil and how kind of rich they are. And obviously it varies too, just even in America. So there's a bunch of forms of selenium. So just to kind of warn you here, there's five different types. So I'm gonna try to walk you through this and hopefully it doesn't get too confusing. So there's the first group of selenium compounds are called the organic forms. And they're called organic forms because these are the forms of selenium that are basically in, they're kind of, yeah, literally they're substituted for sulfur in sulfur containing amino acids. So the first one I want to point out is selenomethionine. So selenomethionine is really just selenium replacing <clears throat> the sulfur atom in, um, yeah, in methionine. And then there's the next one is selenocysteine. And that's when um, selenium just replaces, um, yeah, sulfur and cysteine. So these are the two organic forms. Again, the organic forms are basically the amino acid forms of selenium. So it's selenomethionine and selenocysteine. So that's the first two. And then there's the inorganic forms. So the inorganic forms just basically represents the ones that are not in amino acids. So there's three of those. They all kind of sound the same. So whenever I'm kind of giving a lecture, it's hard. Selenide kind of sounds like selenite a little bit, but um, I'll try to make that distinction. So selenide is the most basic form. It basically doesn't have oxygens attached. Selenite has three oxygens attached. 
and Sela Nate has four. So that's kind of the, the differences here. And remember, organic form, ones that are embedded in, so basically selenium embedded in amino acids. In organic form, they're not in amino acids. They basically just have either hydrogen and or um, oxygen attached. And then these ones are the ones primarily found in plants. So there's super high concentrations of selenium in like cabbage and beets and stuff like that. So yeah, just to kind of summarize these ones, the methionine, the um, cysteine and methionine forms, the organic forms, those are found in both plant and animal products. And then the inorganic forms, the ones not in amino acids, those are found in plant products. And again, that's selenate, the O4 form, selenite, the O3 form, and selenide, which is like the most basic form with no oxygen attached. Um, selenium supplements, um, there you can actually get kind of two different forms. You can get the organic form, so you can get it as the selenomethionine form. Um, I've never seen the selenocysteine form be available, just this one. And then you can also get it in the inorganic form, so not already embedded in an um, in amino acid. And then you can find it as the selenite form, sodium selenite, and then sodium selenate. Um, and both of them are pretty well absorbed. The main thing that happens to all these five forms is that they're eventually converted into this one kind of functional form of selenium in the body. So I'll show you that in a second, all the conversions. There's no digestion required, so the inorganic forms aren't bound to proteins or anything. They're basically just free in foods. So that's these guys. Remember the inorganic forms. So you don't need to cut them off of anything to bring them into the body. And the organic forms can be absorbed intact. So usually they'll just get, yeah, you basically just consume those on their own. Um, and then they are absorbed, obviously, in different ways. So the organic form is absorbed by an amino acid transporter, which makes sense because it's selenium embedded in an amino acid. And then the inorganic forms kind of each have their own way of getting absorbed. So basically the selenide form is passive diffusion. The selenite with the T form, O3, passive diffusion, whereas the O4 form, selenate, is an active transporter ATPase. So just know that it doesn't follow that whole kind of water soluble vitamin, um, you know, like it's not like low passive diffusion for um, kind of higher concentrations and then active transport for low to moderate. So it's really just specific to the type that you're ingesting. So first to go through how the organic form is absorbed. Um, so it's absorbed into the enterocyte via an amino acid transporter, which isn't that complicated or not that surprising either. So that's the selenomethionine form, selenocysteine form, Basically, yeah, just the same as amino acids are um, absorbed. That's how it kind of gets into the enterocyte. And then the seleno amino acids cross the enterocyte intact. So they're not metabolized. So they kind of, they stay this way actually until um, they're kind of metabolized by the body to get to that functional form, which I'll show you in a second. But these two basically stay this way again all the way up until right before they kind of do their function. So they're not broken down in the enterocyte. And absorption is pretty high, it's about 80%. So compared to other minerals, selenium actually has pretty high absorption rates. The inorganic forms, um, so first of all, let's talk about the selenide, this kind of basic form, and then also selenite, the O3 form. So these two are the ones that use basically passive diffusion to get into the enterocyte. So at the brush border, you basically, there's a couple things that happen. This one, so basically the, the most basic form again, selenide, nothing really happens. It gets in by passive diffusion, stays that way. The O3 form, however, basically gets the um, hydrogen kicked off. 
So while it's going through, um, it basically is converted into the kind of SEO3 form or, um, yeah, basically, if you notice, it's just the hydrogens are removed upon entry into the um, enterocyte. And then absorption of these two inorganic ones are 85%. So again, really high for minerals. And then lastly, remember the O4 form or the selenate form. That's the one that is absorbed into the enterocyte via an ATP kind of active transporter. And then kind of the same thing happens to this one where the, for selenate, the, um, again, the hydrogen is kind of like kicked off while it's getting absorbed by, uh, oh, sorry, while it's getting absorbed by this ATPase here. So you remove the hydrogens and then you're just left with the um, selenium and the oxygen. And absorption of this particular one, again, they're all around like 80, 85%, so pretty high. Absorption inhibitors are for selenium are heavy metals, particularly mercury. So we get a lot of mercury actually from, um, or you can depending on the type of fish you eat. So if you're eating high amounts of like shark or there's this um, other like kingfish and stuff like that, there's certain ones that have really high amounts and tilefish and stuff like that. Um, you can actually basically decrease your selenium stores because what happens is, um, yeah, basically selenium and mercury bind in the gut lumen, and then they're both excreted. Um, phytates also are basically, you know, typically they'll bind selenium in food, so nothing too surprising there. Phytates, which we've seen for pretty much every single mineral when we get to these slides, they bind whatever the mineral is in food, and then obviously for the most part, they don't really allow the mineral to be absorbed. Um, so there's no, from my understanding, no heat treatments or anything where you can kind of liberate the selenium from um, the phytates in foods. Absorption enhancers, there's a couple of them and they're not quite sure why they're enhancing absorption. So vitamin C, A, and E, if you take in kind of high amounts of those at the same time as selenium, um, yep, you can, that basically increases absorption and same with glutathione. But remember, absorption is already pretty high. It's like 80 to 85 percent. So in general, unless like soils are depleted, most people don't really have deficiencies of selenium. Here, it's not really like a, a rampant thing or anything like that. It's, yeah, it's mainly just dependent on as long as our foods are providing enough. And I've actually never seen selenium kind of added to different products. I don't know if, if you ever see that, please email me the label. I'd be interested to see, but I don't think we really have problems with them, um, you know, absorption or deficiencies in the U.S. Our soils, I think, have kind of adequate amounts of selenium. And then kind of continuing the story of absorption, uh, moving on to storage and transport. So after leaving the enterocyte, selenium, so both those inorganic and organic forms, they actually bind to um, LDL or VLDL, so basically cholesterol or lipoproteins, and then those are transported to the tissues, and they're not quite sure what the transporter is. They thought it might be the LDL receptor, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and then also just to point out that tissues seem to have higher concentrations of those organic forms so remember the organic forms are selenomethionine and selenocysteine, basically the amino acid forms. Those seem to be um, in higher concentrations. So after entering tissues, um, the organic and inorganic forms are then metabolized. So this is what I was trying to show you. So this looks a little bit complicated, but really all the body's doing is kind of like shuttling all these five different types of selenium and pretty much just making one key kind that can then participate in the key function of selenium. So selenomethionine, first looking at just this one, it's converted to selenocysteine. That's one thing in this whole metabolic process I'm going to show you. But if the um, body wants to store selenium, it stores it as selenomethionine. So basically it will kind of keep whatever selenomethionine it gets and kind of use that as the storage form of selenium in the cell. 
And then if it has enough selenomethionine, it will allow some of that to then be converted to selenocysteine. Selenocysteine is then, so if you take in that too, so you can directly take this in, selenocysteine is then converted into the selenide, that kind of most basic form. And then same goes with those two other inorganic forms, selenate and selenite. So selenate is converted to selenite, and then the selenite's converted to that basic form, selenide. And then all of this is happening. So all this shuttling and conversion you'll see is all happening because the main thing you want to make is selenophosphate. Selenophosphate is the form of selenium required to carry out um, its function in the body. So again, selenometh the two important things to remember here, selenomethionine is the storage form in the cell, and then everything else is kind of converted down because um, we don't store any of these four other forms. They're kind of automatically shuttled and used to create this one, selenophosphate. And selenophosphate is really important because it is incorporated into glutathione peroxidase. So glutathione, basically selenium just functions as a part, a component of glutathione peroxidase. It only has one function, so it's basically got really complicated kind of like, there's a bunch of different structures and a whole bunch of different absorption mechanisms, but the function slides are pretty basic because it's just this one function. It acts as a component, again, of glutathione peroxidase. So that's what I'm trying to show you here. So it's basically a cofactor or a component of, um, of that. And then glutathione peroxidase is also called GPX. And basically it just functions to neutralize peroxides in cells. And glutathione is also needed for this. Basically acts as a cofactor. So just remember this is kind of GSH is kind of like ready to go glutathione. And then kind of the recycled version that's ready um, to help out with reactions. And then GSSG is glutathione that is oxidized. So glutathione peroxidase, I know this is gonna get a little confusing. Selenium is a part of glutathione peroxidase, which basically neutralizes these peroxides and makes them into kind of inert things like water and stuff that's not gonna damage the cell. But a part of this, glutathione is a cofactor in it kind of like iron and copper were cofactors for, um, uh, you know, those, like in the vitamin C slides when we were looking at all those different reactions, like hydroxylation reactions. So glutathione is kind of used up by glut glutathione peroxidase to do this reaction. And then again, just, I'm pointing this out because in the next slide I'm going to refer to it, GSH is like, the ready to go form of glutathione. GSSG is the used up form of glutathione. And then just a bit of a review about peroxides. Peroxides are generated in all tissues as a part of normal metabolism. Um, and then of course, if they're not removed, they basically start to damage cell membranes. So that's why you wanna remove them. And we've talked about them a couple times um, already in this uh, class. Um, GPX is actually, um, we'll just give you a bit of background. So remember GPX is glutathione peroxidase. So it's kind of the, um, the short form of that. And selenium is incorporated into GPX, remember, in that selenophosphate form. So that's this form back here. That's why we convert it down to that. And then those GPX levels and activity are actually what we use to measure selenium status. So I've never actually seen it measured, but um, if you were to look at someone's labs, they wouldn't measure kind of like the amount of selenium floating around in your blood or anything. They would look at the GPX protein levels in your blood. So that's kind of the um, lab marker of that, the plasma marker. And then also just to point out this is what ends up confusing people. So remember we talked about GSSG, 
Where did we see that before? GSSG was back here. This is the used up form of glutathione. So remember, glutathione peroxidase, selenium's a part of this enzyme. Glutathione peroxidase neutralizes peroxides. So that's this reaction here. And in doing so, it uses the cofactor of glutathione. Here's normal glutathione ready to go, and GSSG is the oxidized form of glutathione. So all this slide is showing is that this is just we used up glutathione from that previous slide. In order to kind of recycle glutathione um, and turn it from GSSG to GSH, you need glutathione reductase. This is not the same as glutathione perox peroxidase. Glutathione reductase, we've talked about actually a bunch of times um, in this lecture series. That's the enzyme that just recycles glutathione. So it helps regenerate glutathione. That's glutathione reductase. And then remember too, this one's dependent on niacin. So NADPH helps do that. So glutathione reductase recycles glutathione, totally separate enzyme from glutathione peroxidase, which neutralizes peroxides. So I know they sound the same, but they're totally different things. And then the reason I was showing you what glutathione reductase does is it helps to recycle the cofactor glutathione used by glutathione peroxidase. So hopefully, you know, maybe watch that. That definitely confuses people sometimes, but maybe watch that kind of section of the video over and over if um, it's confusing and you can email me if there's any questions. The main route of excretion, it's been shown it's actually excreted in the urine and the feces. Um, the key way that we actually kind of maintain selenium homeostasis is by excreting kind of high amounts of selenium. And that's just because remember, there's like 80 to 85% of selenium absorbed. So we're, we're going to excrete quite a bit every day. The RDA is 55. Um, and interestingly, you know, we didn't really even fully realize that it was Selenium was, you know, a key nutrient or an essential nutrient until the 80s. So the RDA wasn't even set until almost the 90s, so 1989. And then the RDA was set based on the selenium intake necessary to reach kind of the highest or plateau concentrations of its key function. So being a part of GPX or glutathione peroxidase. So the deficiency disease for selenium is kind of very specific, I should say. Um, it's called Keishan's disease, and this doesn't happen in everyone. It's actually only been noticed in certain parts of the world. It was named Keishan's disease because it was first kind of discovered in this province of China, the Keishan province of China. And what happens with the disease is it actually leads to kind of like heart failure, specifically congestive heart failure and like pulmonary edema. So basically like the lungs will fill up with fluid and it can be pretty deadly. Um, the thing though with this, the thing that's like a little bit confusing is that it's not low selenium intake just by itself that's causing this. It's basically, they discovered it in this province because that province in China already had really, really low amounts of selenium in their soil. And because everyone was kind of deficient in that area, there was this virus that was present. And the virus is only activated if someone is deficient in selenium. So basically, people that have like low amounts of selenium um, that basically makes the virus more virulent, or it basically results if you have a low selenium, then the, this Coxsackie virus is going to basically mutate and become active and basically do all these horrible things to your body, which basically result in like congestive heart failure. So yeah, the virus becomes more virulent, but only in the case or only when there's low selenium stores in the body. And then all of this is called Keishan's disease. And it's what they notice is that it's actually primarily affects um, children and women of childbearing age. And yeah, again, you need two things for this disease to happen. 
you need to already have low selenium stores in your body and then this virus has to be present and then the virus only becomes activated in people's bodies if you have low selenium stores so yeah in general there's you know if you want to read more about it the, there's a pretty nice wikipedia page on Kishan's disease but really people now that they've kind of figured out these mechanisms um, you can prevent it by they've kind of prevented it now just by making sure people are taking selenium supplements in places where soil level levels are low and then you can actually treat it with um, selenium supplements too so you can actually get the virus to kind of go back into the dormant state if you um, kind of increase people's or uh, selenium status so yeah um, selenium's also been kind of associated with cancer risk um, if you know anybody that's supplementing with selenium, it's probably because of cancer. I've seen a couple bottles, um, like supplement bottles, marketed towards reducing cancer risk. So I just kind of wanted to go through some of the studies there and tell you whether or not you should be study, uh, supplementing with this. So first they notice in just observational studies that there were higher rates of cancer in countries that had low soil selenium. And then, yeah, basically they also noticed that in these countries, yeah, there was like lower plasma levels of selenium. So low soil obviously meant that people were eating less of it, so their plasma levels were lower. And then this was just correlated to higher risks of different cancers. So over the years, they've run some kind of long-term supplementation studies. And just to point out, most of them supplemented with about 200 micrograms per day. Sometimes they even combined it with vitamin E. And then a lot of these were done for like six to eight years. So those are pretty long studies. And they were placebo controlled. So what they found was they looked at different cancers. So when they did the supplementation of selenium over seven years, prostate cancer risk decreased by almost half. Um, and then, but it did in another study, increase the risk of skin cancer by 25%. And then in another study that looked at prostate and lung cancer, where selenium was combined with vitamin E, it had no effect. So at this stage, I would say don't supplement with selenium to reduce cancer risk. You know, make sure your selenium stores are adequate, but you don't need to be taking kind of 200 micrograms, which is pretty far over the RDA of 55. So as long as your selenium stores are fine, that should be okay. You don't need to do these kind of inc these kind of high supplementation regimens because science hasn't really supported um, a definitive kind of link between lowering cancer risk and selenium supplementation. The TUL is 400 micrograms per day, so it's interesting. Just a couple of Brazil nuts actually will set you over that. Um, and then selenium toxicity is actually called sel selenosis. And this is all like case studies again. They noticed people taking 1,000 micrograms per day for four months, um, which is kind of crazy to think. Like, you know, if you eat, like, if you're a regular consumer of Brazil nuts, you have like three or four of those a day, this could, you know, this could conceivably happen. But selenosis is kind of one of those things that has nondescript um, symptoms. You know, we always see the kind of nausea, vomiting, you know, numbness of limbs. So there is a toxicity state for it, but it's really hard to remember. You know, it's just the basic nondescript um, uh, symptoms. All right, so that's all I have for selenium. And then moving on to chromium. So chromium, you know, can exist in a whole bunch of different valence states as well, like selenium. But in the body, we just really find it in the three plus form. And we find it, it's got a ubiquitous presence in air, water, and soil. So we really find it all over the place. And then I've had questions in the past about like, oh, if you have like a chrome toaster, is that chromium? So yeah, it is. So objects are plated with chrome, which is chromium. Food sources, um, the highest food source by far is brewer's yeast. So that has basically 186 micrograms of, um, so if you're eating like full on brewer's yeast, which most people wouldn't, you'd get like very, very high amounts. And then the AI for chromium, so it's not an RDA, it's an AI. It's 35 for men, if you wanna write that on here, micrograms per day. 
and 25 micrograms per day for women. So yeah, most people obviously don't eat brewer's yeast. I just added this line here to your slides. You might want to just add that as well. Um, so I know some people in the class, there's always a couple people that have made beer or are actively making beer. So they always wonder, well, if brewer's yeast has this much in just two tablespoons, how much does beer have? So beer has some chromium, but not that much. It's got about, from what I've read, about one to three micrograms per bottle. So for like 350 milliliters, I think um, a typical bottle is. Uh, so yeah, not a really high source of it. Nothing compared to the actual yeast form of it. So high, you know, it's really found, chromium's found kind of everywhere. Uh, people are generally not deficient in it. Um, just as in the general population. So high sources are brewer's yeast and meat, and then moderate sources are found in like fruits and vegetables, basically. Chromium supplements, there's kind of a bunch out there, but I would recommend chromium picolinate has the highest absorption rate. So that's, um, I would recommend that one. And then some people actually just like to take the yeast form too, where you just kind of like take a tablespoon of this yeast. So it is sold kind of in that like brewer's yeast form too, if you want to supplement that way. And from what I've seen, it's like either encapsulated or you can literally just like spoon it, <laughs> spoon it into your mouth and just have some yeast. I haven't tried it, but I can't imagine it tastes all that great. And then so most of the supplements will provide about 50 to 200 micrograms per pill. And so remember the AI is um, 35 and 25. So, you know, kind of much higher than that, uh, much higher than those AI levels for the most part. And then, yeah, I already mentioned it's yeast or tablet forms. You also do get chromium from uh, stainless steel cookware. So if, you, if you're like cooking with stainless steel, you can get chromium from that as well. And yeah, stainless steel will increase your chromium intake. In the body, chromium is not attached to anything. So digestion, yeah, there's nothing there where we need to like use HCL or anything to cut it off of anything. Chromium just kind of comes in that um, three plus form. Um, one thing to point out, really low amounts of chromium are absorbed. So definitely compared to selenium where it was like 80, 85%, for chromium for the most part, we're only absorbing like 2%. And then the mechanisms of absorption are pretty simple. Basically an active transporter with low to moderate intakes. And then with higher intakes, it's passive diffusion. But for both of them, they notice that, yeah, it's about 2% or so, 2% or less that's absorbed. When chromium leaves the enterocyte, it binds on to transferrin to get transported to tissues. So where have we seen this before? Transferrin is what transports iron around the body. So it actually will compete for iron or with iron for um, kind of binding onto this, this uh, transporter. Absorption inhibitors are not surprisingly phytates in foods, um, but they also have noticed that people are, that are taking high amounts of antacids, so like Tums and stuff like that, can develop chromium um, deficiencies. So yeah, just another reason not to be kind of like binging on Tums or something like that. Because basically what happens is chromium will bind to a hydroxyl group when you kind of mess up the um, acidity or pH of your gut. And so when chromium binds onto that, it's kind of a irreversible bind and it won't be absorbed. So it just gets excreted. Absorption enhancers on the other side, um, having kind of higher protein diets help out. The picolinate form, as I mentioned, if you're looking at you know, taking supplements, and I'll show you why people supplement with this. It's actually a pretty cool function of, um, it's only got one function, but it's pretty interesting. So picolinate's the most common form to supplement with because it does have the best absorption. And then vitamin C is also shown to increase um, absorption. But from what I've seen, it's not like it's gonna increase it to like 30% or anything. It increases it from like 2% to like maybe 3%. So kind of minimal. Storage, so remember chromium is transported, attached to transferrin. And then in order to get 
into tissues or into cells, it does use that same receptor that iron does, so the transferrin receptor. And then we're not quite sure where chromium is stored. I honestly, I don't think there's been a ton of research on chromium. Um, I think it's one of those things too that we just discovered that we needed it maybe like 30 years ago or something like that. And so they're thinking it might be stored since it's kind of following the same path as iron with transfer and the transfer and receptor. They're thinking it might be stored with iron and ferritin, but we don't know yet. So the key function of chromium is actually um, kind of like reducing diabetes risk, really. It actually functions to increase insulin receptor activity. So it's probably one of the coolest functions of a mineral. This is the one I always remember. Um, so yeah, just to also, I just want to do a little bit of review here just in case anyone is confused or doesn't really remember how the insulin receptor functions. So just a review probably of like Jamila's class, a very basic review. So remember insulin, main role is to basically get glucose into cells, but insulin doesn't like grab onto glucose and pull it into cells or anything like that. What it does is it binds on to its receptor. So here's the insulin, binds on to its receptor. When insulin binds, it activates this whole interior protein activation cascade in the cell. This protein activation cascade then results in the translocation of GLUT4 transporters. So they're kind of sitting here and then they rise to the surface of the cell GLUT4 transporters, and then once they kind of rise to the surface or to the membrane, then that allows, then basically that allows the influx of glucose. So these little guys here are glucose, then glucose can get in there and then become glycogen or whatever is gonna happen to it. So just remember, insulin is not like dragging glucose into the cell. It basically has, you know, they're, they're two totally separate areas. You can kind of see on the, um, the membrane, it binds to its insulin receptor, starts this activation cascade, which causes these transporters to kind of float up here, and then those allow glucose to come in. So what does chromium do in all this? How does it increase insulin receptor activity? So I'll just walk you through this step by step. So first of all, remember transferrin, that's the thing that delivers chromium to tissues and cells. It delivers chromium, again in that three plus form, to the transferrin receptor. So that's what it binds to on the cell membrane. And then the chromium's released into the cell. So just showing you here. So the chromium is, is released into the cell and at that point it also breaks off of those transferrins. So this is the transferrin breaking off of these chromiums. And then right after that, the chromiums get attached to something called chromodulin. So this complex of chromium chromodulins are formed. And then that whole complex, the chromium chromodulin, binds to the insulin receptor, so on the inside of the cell, and then basically helps boost that whole protein activation cascade. So you still need insulin to bind here. Because remember, well, even taking a step back, what's insulin resistance? Remember, insulin resistance is insulin binding to this and that whole protein activation, interior protein activation cascade that we just talked about in the previous set of slides, that just doesn't occur or it occurs very weakly. So what chromium can do, and this has been shown primarily in prediabetics, when insulin is trying to bind and start that cascade, if chromium is also present, it binds the inside of the receptor and basically helps boost its um, activity. So that's how it helps enhance insulin receptor activity. But you still do need, this confuses people, you still, it's not like it acts like insulin. It basically helps when insulin isn't transmitting a strong enough of a signal. So it helps boost it. And again, this is primarily in pre-diabetic people. And then, of course, when it helps boost that signal, that whole protein activation cascade happens, and then those GLUT4 transporters rise to the surface. And when you have a bunch of those, 
then more glucose can enter the cell, which then lowers plasma glucose levels. So that's how, yeah, that's how it helps with glucoregulation and kind of increasing insulin sensitivity really by kind of boosting the uh, function of the insulin receptor by insulin or boosting the function of insulin, I should say. So that's, you know, that's the only function that we really know that chromium does. And really, you know, it's obviously pretty diabetes related. But one thing I just want to point out straight away before I get into these supplementation regimens, it hasn't been shown to work in people with full-blown diabetes. So type 1, type 2 diabetics, it is not helpful there. But it does help when people are kind of at the early stages, so if they're pre-diabetic or if they have impaired glucose tolerance specifically. So with those people, that's where it helps out. So if you have patients or clients like in the pre-diabetic stage, which is probably pretty common considering obesity is so rampant, um, yeah, definitely try it out. It might actually help increase their insulin sensitivity. Uh, you do need to take 200 micrograms per day and it only starts working after about three to four months. So it does take a while to have kind of full blown effects. But um, this supplementation regimen can help decrease glucose levels by 20 to 30% in um, pre-diabetic. So yeah, I would definitely recommend it before people, you know, in, as an adjunct to like lifestyle therapies, like better diet and more exercise and stuff, but it can help out. Um, and then a lot of times you'll see chromium. The main thing that you'll see it really advertised for is this function. So it's kind of like, what is it called? Alphabetic. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. So it's all like boosting diabetes, health, or whatever. They all market it for that stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the main route of excretion um, is just the urine. But one thing to also point out, it's been noted that people that take in high amounts of like simple sugars or refined sugars have increased excretion of chromium. So if you put someone on this supplementation regimen, it's really important to monitor their intake of sugar. So like simple sugars and make sure that they are not consuming anywhere near 35%. That's actually super high of, um, we do, I analyze a lot of food records and that would be pretty, pretty high because most people consume, you know, like 50% as carbohydrates. And it's usually the average person consumes about 15 to 20% in America, um, as simple sugars. So this is like, you know, more than double that. But still, if, it's, if these supplements are not working, you'll probably want to look at food records and make sure that they're not just excreting at all by um, basically consuming super high amounts of, of simple sugars. Excreting, sorry, excreting all the chromium. All right, so remember again, it's an AI for chromium, 35 micrograms per day for males, 25 micrograms per day for females. And this, you know, they don't have a lot of data about chromium. I think it's just being studied very recently. Um, and yeah, basically, remember AIs, adequate intakes, are basically just indicators of like what the general population is consuming. And we all seem to be kind of healthy with this. But, you know, at the same time, they're, they're starting to look in a lot more to see basically what's the optimal intake of chromium. Uh, to lower or just control um, glucose levels. There's no specific deficiency disease. Um, you know, it's that kind of asymptom or that, or sorry, just like random effects. So it's like weight loss, um, that type of thing. There's actually been like nausea and vomiting and that type of thing reported as well with it, just random stuff. But they're saying that maybe insulin resistance and elevated glucose levels are associated with it. Um, you'd have to kind of tease that apart by actually measuring chromium levels. Um, and then again, super important, people always ask, so now, you know, do diabetics need to have increased chromium intake? So please remember these supplements just work in people with impaired glucose tolerance or pre-diabetics. There's no evidence showing that these supplements work in people with full-blown type 2 diabetes. Uh, there's no TUL for chromium. Again, I just don't think it's very well studied. Um, there's some people that have taken up to like a thousand micrograms per day, maybe for this insulin sensitizing effect. That appears to be safe. 
Um, and then there has been some reports in hospitals where people were taking up to 2,500 a day for six months, and that resulted in um, basically liver, major liver and kidney problems. So yeah, you definitely don't want to be taking that much in, but they still don't have enough data to set a firm TUL. Okay, let's just do kind of a quick review of the two that we did today. So selenium and chromium. So what are the food sources? These ones are a little hard to remember. Like zinc and copper is easy. It's like meat and seafood. But these ones, I usually say, well, what are the main, what are the two main sources of this that really stuck out? So remember, selenium was Brazil nuts. Chromium was brewer's yeast. And then both of them are kind of found in like meats and stuff. Um, selenium's more like meats and nuts and stuff like that. But then yeah, vegetables. And then chromium I'd say is pretty much found in small concentrations everywhere. But it is in brewer's yeast, but beer is not a really high, it doesn't really give you super high amounts of it. Remember it was like one to two micrograms per day. And then the AI is 35 to 25. Function, they each only have one function. So what was that? Might be easier to remember chromium, we just did it. So that's that whole insulin receptor activity one and pre-diabetics increases that. And then selenium, remember it's involved in that enzyme. What was that called? Glutathione peroxidase. And what does that do? It neutralizes um, peroxides. So deficiency, what's that deficiency disease with the virus for selenium? What was that called? That one's Keishan's disease. And then the toxicity, they also name the disease even though it's not really, it's kind of nondescript. It's called selenosis. And then deficiency of chromium that may lead to kind of insulin resistance. They still need more research there, but that's one of the things that is kind of associated with lower um, chromium plasma levels. And then toxicity, there's no TUL, there's no actual um, kind of toxicity uh, disorder at this point. Okay, great. So again, um, if anything's confusing, please email me. And yeah, I will see you at the, well, I won't see you, but talk to you at the next lecture, which is our the last lecture um, for this whole class, basically. Great. Okay. Have a great rest of your day.